This is the Wealth Net Market Call of the Week, highlighting investment trends that could affect your wealth. Globally aware with a geopolitical and quantitative perspective. Hello, this is Lewis Giannis with WealthNet Investments, and this is the Market Call of the Week. It is October 25th, 2018, and today I'm going to be talking about the cost of owning various types of investments, because I think there's a lot of confusion out there. When you look at the news, you see, you know, kind of a race towards zero. You see very large brokerage firms coming out saying, look, we're going to sell you this exchange-traded fund for zero cost, and there's, you know... Uh, going to be no fees associated with it, no transaction costs. Well, I want to kind of talk about the concept that there's no free lunch. And I think we all kind of know that intuitively. And I'm just going to dive into that a little bit. And towards the end, what I'm really going to focus in on is why it is that we like to buy individual stocks rather than buying packaged products. And there's a very specific reason why, and I'm going to walk through the rationale on that. So first, I want to start off just by talking about three of the largest exchange-traded funds out there that track the S&P 500. I'm just going to use those exchange-traded funds as an example to illustrate low-cost investing. You know, uh, there's a big craze uh, for indexing. There's a lot of people out there that want to own the indexes. They get out there and, you know, they say, hey, you know, most managers don't beat the S&P 500, so let's just go buy the indexes. The interesting thing is when you look at the facts, there still is an underperformance there, even if you buy the indexes. So let's just look at the three largest exchange traded funds that are uh, tracking the S&P 500. And the first one would be, of course, the SPY. The SPY, the spider, it's been around the longest in that category. And if you look at this chart here, what this chart shows is, the performance of the S&P 500 itself, the, the unmanaged indexed, that's a total return index, the S&P 500, that's the green line that you see there. And then underneath there is uh, two graphs, really, they're very close together. One is the net asset value. So that's the net asset value returns of the uh, SPY ETF and also the price total rate of return plus dividends as well. That's the blue line. And you can barely see the blue line because it's actually, they're almost exactly the same. The first thing you see is that look how much less over time you've earned as an investor owning a passive index without trading it, just owning it and buying it versus the S&P 500 index itself. Why is that? Well, I'm gonna dive into the really the costs, the hidden costs that are associated as well as the unhidden costs associated with owning an index fund. Clearly, you can see there's a difference between owning the index itself, which you really can't own You know, a hypothetical index. There's friction in there, right? So there's a, a relatively big gap. So this, this chart here goes back to 2000. 2008 and you could see that the spread is you know around let's see the 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 actual s p 500 looks like it's roughly around oh i don't know 100 dollars worth there and then the actual index itself is well over 120. okay so long-term investors still have lots of costs and you know even if you go to the the other ones out there ivv is another one you can see here there's also a gap there and if you go to the one after that which would be the voo that one also has a gap too if you look between or underneath the graphs, each one of these graphs, you'll see that there is a kind of a, a spread, a bar chart where there's ups and downs, that blue line there, the blue bar chart. That blue bar chart shows the monthly premium discount and, and, and uh, premium and discount versus the net asset value. When you buy an exchange traded fund, you still are dealing with market impact. And, and you know, a lot of people will tell you you don't have a market impact, but the truth of the matter is there is a market impact. There is a spread between what the net asset value is in the marketplace and what you're actually filled at. And what this actually shows is the averages of that. And that, that, that is a real cost. It could be in your favor. It could not be in your favor. Um, I think uh, a, a conservative assumption would be that it's not going to be in your favor. But that's another another thing you got to consider. You also have commission costs when you buy an exchange traded fund. You know, it, it's probably not going to, if you're a long-term investor, it's not going to really make a big impact. However, it is there. It's another one of those frictional costs. So if we just kind of dissect this down, let's look at the five-year and the 10-year annual returns in these uh, uh, four tables that I'm going to go over here. The first thing is you'll notice is that the SPY uh, annual rate of return uh, and the IVV and the VOO's rate of return versus the, the S&P 500, there's that spread. I want to calculate that spread. And what that total spread is, is really going to represent is the total cost of holding that ETF. And the total cost, you can dissect them down into two main categories. One would be your holding expenses, and the other one would be uh, kind of your 
expense ratio, the visible expenses and the commissions, right? Just for simplicity's sake, I'm just gonna take the commissions out. I'm gonna say you're not paying any commissions on these. And uh, because you can do that in some, some brokerage firms. So if you look at the expense ratios, the SPY has a expense ratio of nine basis points. IVV and VOO both have an expense ratio of four basis points or 0.04%. You notice that the spread between the uh, the total rate of returns, if you go down to the annual holding costs, you can see that, that for example, over a 10 year period of time, the SPY underperforms the passive index by 13 basis points per year. So there is a cost even for being passive. And even the, uh, the IVV and the VOO have a 3%, or not 3%, excuse me, a 0.03% spread there. The VOO hasn't been around very long, so it's really hard to to get uh, you know good numbers on that, but the VOO is 0.02%. So clearly there's some expenses there. Now the other thing that we want to point out is that when you buy an S&P 500 index and most of these ETFs and and passive indexes, you're going to get a market cap weighted strategy. And what that means is that you're basically making the assumption that I wanna put more of my money in those companies that are worth more in the market today. That sometimes is a great strategy, especially when you have a bull market. And then sometimes it's a very poor strategy, especially when the market starts correcting because those companies that are the most expensive tend to be in the top of the list and you have more of your money there and you can have very sharp corrections. Let's just take a look at and compare that to owning stocks. See, this is the thing that I want to kind of talk about because if we, if we buy stocks, and if you listen to some of the other market calls, we have the ability to be active and we can customize and then we can go after alpha factors. We can try to find those companies with stronger valuation, stronger quality, stronger trend and momentum because that will give us an edge. You know, there's statistical analysis, just really reams of statistical analysis that shows that there are so-called market anomalies where we can actually go out and look for these certain characteristics, companies that are trading at good valuation, et cetera and have an opportunity to beat the market itself by a larger spread. So what I'm gonna do right now is just kinda of isolate down the cost of trading a stock portfolio for different size uh, investors. And I think the real issue when it comes to whether or not you invest in individual stocks has to do with how much money you have and how much you're going to allocate to equities in your strategy. Uh, in, in this case, I'm gonna use a simple, uh, I'm gonna show two strategies. I'm gonna show one with 30 stocks and one with 50 stocks. There's a lot of research out there that shows that you can get uh, diversification with really 50 stocks, you get most of the diversification. I saw one study in particular, which I'll go over in a, in later, where roughly 90% of your diversification benefits are derived if you have 50 stocks. So we, we still have that diversification benefit there or, or capture most of that diversification benefit. Let's just go through this table real quick. And, and I'm gonna go over the assumptions with this table. This table here shows the number of stocks is 30 stocks and the commissions are a dollar. So if you were Trading, there are brokerage firms where you literally can pay a dollar per trade and it's a realistic cost. And, and some of the larger broker firms, you're still paying $4.95 and it's becoming more and more difficult for us to justify actually working with those brokers because they're really you know charging too much if you ask me. Um, so especially given what, you know, the way technology is allowing us to be more efficient. Um, anyhow, so let's just assume we're going to be more active and we're going to have a 30% turnover. Okay. So we're going to roughly turn over a third of our portfolio every year, and we're going to pay a bid ask spread. So anytime you invest in stocks, you are going to be paying that bid ask spread. And that's another part of the cost, by the way, of of owning a mutual fund or an exchange traded fund or a mutual fund is everybody is paying those bid ask spreads. When you go out there and you invest, obviously you're gonna, you're gonna have the bid ask spread and then you're also gonna have market impact costs. Now, if you're a smaller investor, the market impact costs could be literally zero. Um, however, I'm just gonna be really negative and say, look, everybody's gonna pay market impact costs. And we're gonna say that impact market impact cost is 10 bips. Now I'm using 10 bips as an example or 0.10% because we're dealing in large liquid stocks. Now, obviously if you trade smaller companies or if you're international and, and you're trading emerging markets, you might have, you will have larger impact costs most likely. So let's just compare that to the cost of the ETFs because what we see is the holding costs, et cetera, based on the data we saw looking at analyzing it from Morningstar Direct's data, which is a good data source in my opinion, we're looking at a basic holding cost of seven bips. So if you look down here and you look at the costs at different portfolio values, you can see portfolio values starting from $10,000 going up to 5 million. You could see that the initial cost when you first invest in that portfolio 
you're gonna have to pay commissions right when you go in. So what, what we do here is we assume a 10 year holding period and we discount back those commissions at 3%. We include the bid ask spread and the market impact costs and the holding costs of commissions from the turnover, the bid ask spread and, and you know from the turnover. So you put those together, you got your initial costs, your holding costs, and you notice the expense ratio has got a, a zero, a goose egg, because when you own those stocks individual, individually, you're not going to pay any expense ratios. So then your total costs start at, like for example, a $10,000 portfolio, it's pretty expensive. It's 84 basis points to, to have a portfolio of 30 stocks that turn, you turn over 30% per year. So you, you probably wouldn't wanna do that unless you have a big edge, right? Uh, you know, if you have $100,000 on the other hand, you're, you're off by, compared to the index, you're about five basis points. If you have $250,000, you're at basically a break even compared to a passive index, even though you're trading more. So you can see how these numbers work out, especially in liquid instruments, where you're really, it becomes the investor's advantage if you are active to own the individual securities directly. And that's one of the reasons why we do this. If you go to 500,000, a million dollars, you see you actually get a cost advantage. And if we're applying alpha strategies like momentum, value, quality, then we have the opportunity to have 200, 300, 400 basis points uh, outperformance. Now, if we buy the index funds, we know we're, we're, we're accepting the average. We know we are not giving ourselves an opportunity to do better. Uh, I think that's, that's really it in a nutshell. The numbers look different if you have 50, 000, uh, 50 stocks. If you have 50 stocks, then the break even is higher. It's like uh, around $500,000. And this is an active strategy. Now, if you wanted to, you could buy uh, a representative sa rep representative sample of the stocks uh, of the index and not trade it as often and, and do more like a 10% uh, turnover and you would have even better looking numbers. So we can get more active and we can have an opportunity to do better than the index. Plus, there's a lot of advantages. Now, the advantages really get even greater if you compare it to mutual funds, because not only do the mutual funds have the issue of the uh, uh, invisible costs, invisible costs, but they also have some, some poor taxation issues and they generally have higher expense ratios. So what this little table shows here now is kind of the attributes of, of ETFs, mutual funds and stocks and comparing them piece by piece or attri attribute by attribute. So for example, we have the visible costs. The visible costs would be the initial commissions. Uh, you, and then you have your initial bid ask. Everybody is gonna pay the bid ask spread, whether you have an ETF or a mutual fund uh, or stocks. And when those managers in the mutual funds and ETFs go out there and buy, they're gonna be pay, paying market impact costs and initial bid, bid ask spreads. Those are invisible costs that you don't see, but they're there. And then you also have your trading costs from your turnover. Now that's invisible uh, for ETFs and mutual funds, but for stocks, it's visible. So, you know, everybody is gonna pay the trading costs. Uh, the institutions that are trading larger dollar amounts will pay less and than, than a retail trader, however, or investor. However, they're still there, no matter what. Expenses and administrative costs, if you have stocks, you don't have those. Um, you can see what those those are in the ETF and mutual funds. You can kind of look and look look up the expense ratios. You can, you get diversify. You can you can get diversification across the board. And a real key aspect differentiator about why we do what we do is that you for most ETFs you have to accept a market cap weight. That's just kind of the nature of it. There are some fundamentally weighted, some value and momentum weighted, etc. And there's some exceptions to that. But for most of those available products out there, you're going to be paying, get, doing a market weighting scheme. Now, the thing with mutual funds, and this is something that's really not talked about a lot, is you've got a lot of closet indexing. If you look at the number of stocks that many of these mutual funds have, they own so many stocks that they replicate the index very closely. And so you pay a lot of fees and maybe potentially excess phantom tax for that the privilege to be in that mutual fund. So we're not a huge fan of mutual funds. ETFs have a really strong place. Uh, and stocks, we have the customizability. We have the tax flexibility. We can pursue alpha strategies in mutual funds and in stocks. In ETFs, you might, you know, you might be, be able to, you could do it. And there are some uh, great ETFs out there that do that. And so, and those might be appropriate. So if we're gonna be looking in the marketplace if you have enough assets, if you have, I would say if you have over $500,000, for most people, if you're a balanced to growth type investor, 
I would say that you really should be looking at using stocks, individual stocks with a disciplined strategy. There is no free lunch and it just makes total sense, right? I mean, we, we can get a lot of uh, marketing messages that can throw you off. Now this, uh, I wanna go over kind of the tax consequences briefly. One of the beautiful things about owning individual stocks and ETFs, both of them have tax benefits. And in some ways, ETFs have better tax benefits because you can kind of wash gains out. Uh, so if, you, if you're in a, a tax-free account or a tax-deferred account, you know, uh, you, you, you have more of a reason to have mutual funds or, or, or individual stocks. But even then, you know, I think individual stocks win, win out and so do ETFs. But this study here uh, was done by Research Affiliates and they used the same data set that we use, the Morningstar Direct data set. And they basically uh, came out, it was, there was a piece they did, is your alpha big enough to cover your taxes? And it just basically shows that ETFs have a tax advantage. I wanna go over briefly a little graph here and it looks really you know, complicated, but it's a real simple concept, concept and it really has to do with diversification. There was a really interesting article, Equity Portfolio Diversification, How Many Stocks Are Enough? It was kind of a white paper, evidence from five developing markets. And in this paper, they came out, and there's lots more that we could choose from that would show a similar result, but they came out showing that, hey, if you get that stock up to 50 stocks, you really get close to diversifying away this what's called the idiosyncratic risk or the risk of an individual security. So, uh, you know, blowing up in, in the portfolio, blowing the portfolio returns up. So you can get that diversification with 50 stocks, 30, you're getting really close, but it, you know, 50 is, is more ideal. That's really all I have for today. The, the whole thing, the bottom line, it is if you have a larger portfolio and you want active management, you want to try to do better than the indexes and you want to have more risk management involved. I really highly recommend owning individual securities directly and kind of like having your own mutual personal mutual fund. This is Lewis Giannis with WealthNet Investments. If you like this kind of information, feel free to contact us. Uh, go to our website at www.wealthnetinvest.com. Look me up on uh, Twitter and happy investing and trading. If you like this information, be sure to subscribe and follow us on Twitter and Facebook. The market calls are designed for informational purposes and should not be considered investments advice. As always, do your homework, assess the risk, and invest in light of your personal goals.